guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 160. Now, if you recall, I thought it would be a fun idea that instead of just choosing the games for these retrospectives myself, if I had a bit of a contest and let you guys submit your ideas uh, for games that you think I should cover on the show, I got some really great submissions, and I sadly had to just go with one, but I'm going to keep the others. Hopefully get to those eventually. But anyway, uh, without further ado, here is this week's winner, Mr. Chris Otis. Hey, Matt. Greetings from Garden State, fellow... English professor Chris Otis. I think you should do Project Firestar for your next retrospect, and I'll tell you why. I know it's a big cliche, I know it's EA, but that's before they turn to the dark side. While it did use lots of themes from the movie Aliens, it did basically create the survival horror genres we know today. Basic use of small weapons, big monsters, and dark hallways with music and sounds that still scare the heck out of me to this day. The space station itself always answered the question of how can the situation get worse, and the game puts you in constant situations that were just scary as hell. I think every survival horror purist should play this and see a retrospective on it. Cheers to you, Matt. You do great work. Now here we go with a little game called Project Firestart. This is a game widely considered to be the first ever true survival horror game designed by Jeff Tunnell and Damon Sly of Dynamics. Now this is a, a great game and it's, it's definitely worth looking at, but it would have been a lot more successful if they hadn't had uh, such a horrible time developing it. it. Ended up taking two and a half years to make this game, a lot longer than they had intended, and a lot more resources than they had planned for. Uh, the upshot was it didn't come out until 1989, and when it did, it was only available on the Commodore 64 computer. I don't know how well you know your uh, platform history, but by 1989, you had a lot of better machines out on the market than the C64. The Commodore Amiga had been out since 85. You had the Atari ST. Hell, even the DOS machines were catching up. I mean, this would be like a new game coming out today for the PlayStation 2 or the original Xbox. It's not going to get a, the fanfare that it deserves, no matter how groundbreaking it is. And it really was a very ambitious design. I mean, the goal was to make a horror movie in outer space. And to do that, they pioneered a lot of the techniques that you'll see in later games, like Alone in the Dark and Resident Evil. A lot of camera, quote-unquote, camera tricks, like panning, close-ups, uh, fades, montage. You know, techniques that are common today, but were revolutionary at the time. I'm actually really impressed with how much juice they were able to squeeze out of that old platform. I mean, this game looks great on the C64. It's uh, really a nice achievement. I'd love to get these guys on the show and grill them about why they didn't ever release this or port it to some of those other platforms. Now, the story of this is obviously uh, inspired by Ridley Scott's Alien and Aliens films. I mean, he, even the ship there is called <laughs> Prometheus and kind of a strange coincidence. Uh, but instead of aliens, uh, we're dealing with these uh, genetically modified creatures. Uh, they're supposed to be slaves. They go down in mines and do dangerous tasks. You know, you think they would have watched enough Star Trek at this point to know that that kind of uh, project never turns out very well. Kind of hard to get funding, I think, for a slave race. But anyway, uh, of course, it all goes wrong, and... Uh, for whatever weird reason, they're going to send in one guy, all by himself, uh, very poorly armed, uh, to deal with the situation. you got to get the uh, the notes or the log to figure out what happened. Uh, there's a lady that you need to rescue, and then you need to blow the whole ship up and, and get the hell out of there. Now, there is a twist uh, to the story, but in, you know, in any case, this isn't the most groundbreaking uh, science fiction ever, but... Frankly, it doesn't have to be. Uh, games, in my opinion, don't have to have these convoluted, complicated plots that we're getting uh, nowadays. It's it's really nice, I think, that they did keep it simple because that lets you focus on the what's really important in a horror film or game, and that's keeping you in that state of uh, tension. And they do that really well, as uh, we'll see. You see here he's explaining that Apparently your guy's kind of a, ordinarily a Clint Eastwood type character, Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of guy, but uh, since uh, he's on a spaceship, he can't carry a regular weapon, because that obviously could blow a hole in the hole and <laughs> suck him out into space. 
So instead, he's going to carry around this really weak laser weapon. And that's going to actually come into play uh, here in a minute. And Although it's uh, kind of irritating, I guess, you got such a weak weapon, it, it actually works quite well for what they're trying to accomplish here story-wise. Well, anyway, let's get into the game and see what it looks like. Now, since this is a C64 game, I imagine most people probably played it with the joystick. Though, of course, you could play with the keyboard, and you're basically just moving left and right and shooting. There are a few situations where you can go up and down. I guess that's the pseudo 3D aspect of this. But actually, the, the layout here kind of reminds me of uh, Space Quest. Now, something else they do uh, that's straight out of the horror film handbook is not show you the monsters right away. They only gradually unravel those guys, and uh, what they want to do first is build up the tension, build up the anticipation, and they do that with scenes like this. you got a dismembered corpse here, and the words uh, danger apparently written in his own blood. <laughs> you know, something very, very, very bad is happening. You know, I think I'll just go back to my shuttlecraft and come back with a troop of space marines. No, I'm just kidding. Now, let's go get them. That's a pretty big research vessel uh, that you have to deal with here. Apparently it came with a map. I was, have not been able to find a PDF version of, the, of this map, so not really sure what it looked like, but there are other maps you can find online uh, from the fans. But they've uh, conveniently marked the corridors for you. You see there's Corridor A, uh, so you can find that on your map and figure out where you are. It's, uh, you're probably not going to be able to beat this game on the first playthrough. It's going to take several attempts uh, for you to learn the layout of this ship well enough to be able to uh, complete it. Quite a few things you have to do uh, in order to win. Uh, what I'm going to try to do first is find this ID card uh, that I need to use the elevators. I don't know how well it comes across uh, just watching this, but you know the fact that I'm several minutes in and have yet to fight any monsters or even see them is definitely adding to the tension. You keep expecting these things to pop up at any second. And you don't really know what to expect if you haven't played it before, which makes it even better. Uh, so let's see, I'm still trying to find my way around this uh, this ship. Love what they did with Corridor K there, nice uh, rainbow-colored panels. Notice how they made these corridors really nice and long, too. It's, I guess it was easy. It didn't take up much memory for them to <laughs> lengthen the corridor. Adds to the uh, gameplay value, I'm sure. Okay, I found the elevator. Let's go to level uh, three and see if we can get that ID card. Oh, and there's <laughs> already having to swap the discs all around. Using an emulator here, so it's a little bit, a little easier than actually having to swap out discs constantly. Ah, and yet more carnage. Even back in 1989, this was probably considered excessive amount of uh, gore. And you got some pretty horrific scenes here. You know, I think, too, the lack of uh, sound effects and music at this point is is even making it even more tense. Just sort of in this quiet place, it's absolutely still, except for your footfalls. And yet you're, you know there's something really bad on, on this <laughs> vessel. I mean, this is uh, really good stuff. You really got to hand it to these guys. They know, they knew exactly what they were doing. Quite a few rooms to explore, too, and they each have their own little story, I suppose. You know, there's a... I need to find a tape to play in that <laughs> VCR. I think they actually call it a, a VCR. I guess that's one difficult thing about science fiction is trying to determine what technologies will still be around. And uh, I think this is like 2050 or something like that. Now, the reason I'm walking over to these corpses is that's the way you pick up items. You get close enough to the item or the corpse... And if there's anything on it, a little uh, message will pop up asking you if you want to pick it up, and then you just hit the, the fire button. So, you know, another nice uh, gameplay feature, I guess, you know, makes encourages you to get up close to these corpses. And, you know, God knows what, what might happen. You know, who knows, uh, maybe one of them will come alive and try to grab me. You know, good horror, good horror film. Okay, there's the ID, ID card that I needed. Another nice uh, scene there. You see something must have broken out of there, <laughs> whatever it was. I probably don't want to encounter quite yet. Also got a new laser gun. You can only carry two at any time, and you have to completely use it up uh, before you can 
get another one. So that's another limitation slash feature, you know, however you want to look at it. And even these loading screens are pretty effective at raising the tension. Now they're going to employ a nice little technique here in a second, uh, straight out of the, again, straight out of film. So I'll just be quiet and let you experience it too. I actually screamed at that moment. You couldn't hear me because this is in space, but uh, nevertheless, that really jars you, especially if you're playing this uh, in the dark uh, with headphones on and all that. It's been quiet for so long, you just didn't expect it. And I think that's the key to an effective horror. You know, if you want to make somebody jump, you do things unexpectedly. Now, what I'm looking at here is the computer, looking at part of the log, figuring out what happened. And this was another big innovation. You know, it's, it's a nice way to flesh out the backstory. And it uh, makes sense in the context of the game that these scientists would be keeping these uh, notes so you can read up to figure out what, what happened on the ship. And, and uh, if you really read it carefully, it even, even makes it scarier if you let your imagination do its work. You know, this is a technique, of course, that's going to become just commonplace in almost every other uh, survival horror game. I've got to admit that I've never been completely sold on this technique uh, just because it does take you out of the action of the game and allows you to relax. I guess it could have been worse if it just had popped up and say, uh, it said, look at entry number 12 in your space journal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's going to do that, but eh. So I'm back in the corridor now, and for some reason, some scary music is playing. That probably does not bode well. It's another good example of uh, the film technique. <laughs> you know, why is that music playing? Now, let's see if we can escape it by popping in here. You know, I like what they did with the rooms. You know, a lot of these rooms look different. There's not always much you can do in them. Uh, but they did put some time into the decor. Uh, this room here has an energy pod or energy uh, chamber of some sort. Apparently, it's uh, only useful if you are almost dead. I don't know if I mentioned this, but the those brackets on the bottom of the screen, the one on the lower left is my health, and the one next to it is my ammo supply or battery supply. You notice how the music's getting louder now. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, that's the bad guy. Oh, and my little gun is not doing very well. Oh, he's still coming? Oh, jeez. Okay, look at that. Perfect. Oh, and then there's one behind me. <laughs> I love, oh, you gotta love this. I mean, you gotta get those, those monsters to almost get to you before you can kill them. That's a great design decision. Still got the adrenaline, adrenaline pumping Sid tune blasting away there. Game just suddenly got a whole lot more interesting. I'm back in here. So I got the ID cards now. I need to try to get to the uh, the chamber. Oh, no. Now I'm surrounded by these <laughs> these guys. Yeah, if they touch you, it doesn't take them very long to start damaging you. Oh, and he's following me. Almost out of ammo. Look at that. Only three batteries left. I don't know if I'm going to survive this. Like that. No sooner did the victory tune in before the <laughs> suspense music played again. Uh, this is not looking very good. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this, but that timer in the lower right is actually the time limit for the game. If that runs out, then they show up and just blow up the whole research vessel with me on it, so that's not very good. They've done, they've done just about everything they could do to make this game more exciting. Now here comes some exposition. They're showing me something happening on another part of the vessel. You know, again, something common in movies. I don't know how they can justify the character seeing this. I mean, I guess it's for the player's eyes only. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, I guess we'll just go with it. I went ahead and jump cut to the area where she's at. Lots of aliens for me to shoot, and I am officially out of ammo. Switching to the other gun. All right, it's time to wake her up. Well, that was a bit anticlimactic. I guess they couldn't afford to squeeze in a little 
screen there, but she's up and about and looking quite sexy. It's amazing how much uh, detail they were able to get out of this uh, these 8-bit pixels. Oh, wait, now we have a transition. What the hell? Oh, I guess they... That's a little glitch. I guess they didn't expect me to have a rescued already. <laughs> okay. Well, where is she? There she is. So we're making pretty good progress here. Just have to get her to the waste pod, then go to another part of the ship and launch the pod, then set the self-destruct, and then get back to my shuttle and get the hell out of here. So making a decent progress here. Just wanted to show you what happens here if you fail in your rescue attempt. Look at this. I mean, they actually worked in a very sad... I guess they'd call this a montage. Showing you the dead Mary. And most people would probably reload, you know, at this point, but you don't have to. You could just continue the game. That illustrates one of the problems with uh, games versus movies is uh, that ability to reload and get the good ending. You know, in the movie, they can kill people off. It's a little bit harder to do that and justify it in the game. So here's where I'm supposed to be with her. I had to escort her to this chamber. She tells me, don't leave her in there. You gotta find the eject button. She is getting into the waste, the waste pod. For some reason, the waste pods on these research vessels are pressurized, and oxygenated. Oh, she looks so sad. That's amazing. It's just amazing how they are, they're able to tug at your heartstrings like this, given this, you know, allegedly primitive music and, and graphics. You know, but it still has an impact. You know, I really don't want to <laughs> let this woman down. <laughs> so just another one of those meanwhile exposition type scenes. So something's happening to these uh, creatures, and it's probably not good for me. And as if you thought things couldn't possibly get any worse, uh, now the bad guy is about to deactivate the, the lights, and I'll be in the dark. Oh, no. Fortunately, it's not completely dark. It would have been kind of neat, I guess, uh, they didn't have the capability of a flashlight, like with uh, Doom 3. But nevertheless, uh, very scary. Now i got to go all the way back, get the lights back on, and get the heck out of here. There's going to be some more twists before I'm done. But anyway, I think this gives you a pretty good taste of what Project Firestart is all about. They've definitely nailed that horror movie vibe, that alien feel. You know, and the fact that they managed to accomplish all this on a Commodore 64 is uh, what really makes this impressive. Now, is it the first ever survival horror game? I think so. I mean, you got everything that uh, Alone in the Dark has except for the true 3D. You know, so I guess that's the deciding factor here. We've only got pseudo 3D, but I mean, come on. <laughs> it's good enough for me. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the first part of a brand new interview series, this time with Mr. Graham Devine of the 7th Guest 11th Hour fame, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. You're keeping the uh, this show alive, you're keeping the episodes coming, so thank you very much for that. If you would like to make a donation, you can do so at armchairarcade.com. Just look for the Match Hat link at the top right corner of the page. Also, if you would like to submit a video uh, with an idea for a future uh, retrospective. You can do that as a video response here at YouTube, or just send me a link uh, to your video in an email or uh, YouTube uh, messages. What I don't really care as long as I got some way to see the video. I'll add it to the collection, and hopefully your name will be drawn next time, and you can see your game featured in a retrospective. Now well, let's get to what's really important: the ale of the week. Uh, this week I have a really a. Uh, a really intriguing uh, selection. This is from the Hebrew uh, Brewery. Hebrew, the chosen beer. It's a really fun logo. Uh, this is a Hot Mana IPA. It's uh, brewed by the Schmaltz Brewing Company. Um, let's see, where is Schmaltz Brewing Company located? Saratoga Springs, New York. And apparently this has 6.8% uh, alcohol by volume, so uh, not too weak, not too strong. Should be just about right. Uh, so let's get this open and see what 
uh, hop mana is all about. So I got some hop mana here in the old drinking horn. Been smelling this is it smells kind of like the Old Testament. Let's give it a taste. Mmm. Oh, that's good stuff. It's definitely not kidding about the hoppy factor of this. If you like hops, you're going to really love this one. It's a little bitter, kind of a little bit of a, a nutty flavor. You know, I think this would go very well with a wild iguana kebab. <sighs> Quite delicious, actually. I'm rather fond of this one. I think I'll give it a four out of five drinking horns. Really good stuff. If you see this, don't be afraid to try it out. I think you'll be very pleased. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. Uh, this time the quotation comes from Woody Allen, and it goes something like this. If my film doesn't make any profit, I know I'm doing something right. See you guys next week. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.